I guess I would like to start with, I'll show you a brief outline. If there's anything on there that you have any questions about, there'll be time uh, towards the end of the uh, uh, presentation that you guys can ask any questions that you have. Um, going to kind of take a, a whirlwind uh, tour of some common things that I see, see out there and um, what people are asking me about. So there may be some stuff that isn't specifically what I go over, but feel free to um, ask me any questions. You can ask questions as we go along, that is fine. Or you can wait to the end, whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, I guess what I would like to start with is do not blindly treat trees with pesticides unless you know what is ailing the tree. Uh, often you do more damage than good. Um, often you kill a lot of uh, beneficial insects or you can uh, increase insect pesti pesticide resistance. And you can also waste a lot of time and money. I do a lot of house calls where I go and visit residents and talk and consult about their trees. It's a free service if anybody is interested in that. Please grab one of my cards that's on the back and call. We can set something up. It's a, it's a free service and um, love to help any of you guys out possible. I see some familiar faces. Some people have actually been at their houses before. Um, but often I go to people's houses and they say, well, what's going on with my tree? I sprayed it with this. Before I even get there and see what, they look, what, what I'm looking at, they tell me that they already treated their tree with something. And it turns out that it's not getting enough water or something like that. So don't treat something unless you know what you're treating for. Uh, you can do a lot of damage that way. And once again, it's a waste of time and money. So if you take anything away from this, take that. <laughs> also, a lot of insect and disease problems can be, um, you won't have a lot of them if you have proper species selection and promote favorable growing conditions. It's really the best defense you can have. There are several trees out there that, that get affected by a myriad of, of, of pests and insects, where there are certain trees that are virtually insect and disease resistant. So, I do, once again, I do a lot of house calls, and if I look at my, uh, my crystal ball of what I'm gonna see before I go out there, 80% of my calls are what's wrong with my aspen, my maple, or my ash tree. And I normally know what I'm gonna see before I even go out. And oddly enough, those are three trees that I don't recommend planting, but oddly enough, you go to a nursery and they're big sellers there. They have a different business model than I do. My business model is caring for trees, until they're mature, um, and I want them to be healthy the entire time. So these are trees that, once again, I don't plant a lot of them, and they have a lot of problems. I'm not saying don't plant them, but know um, some of the potential problems that they may have. All right, so we're going to start with emerald ash borer. Everybody's heard of emerald ash borer, I hope. Has everybody heard about it in this room so far? All right, good get a lot of questions about emerald ash borer. Um, and I could probably talk about an hour alone on emerald ash borer, so I'm gonna give a kind of a fast presentation, then I'll stop if you have any questions on emerald ash borer. Specifically, then we can, uh, I'll answer the questions on that. So emerald ash borer, also known as the green menace, it's actually, uh, it's a shame that it's so destructive because it's actually, for an insect, it's actually a good looking insect. Um, it has been called the most destructive pest to ever hit North America. It is the 10 of all 10s. Um, it was first identified in 2002 in Michigan, and they have traced it back to coming in originally in uh, packing crates from, from uh, China. So this is a uh, natural, uh, I'm sorry, native pest to China, and the ash trees and the emerald ash borer have grown up together, so the, it's a minor pest in Asia. It's, uh, it doesn't kill the trees. The trees are really resistant to the emerald ash borer. Unfortunately here, it does not have any, any um, natural predators, and it is just ravishing all ash trees. Um, so where is EAB? EAB is in 30 states now. And it is, this map doesn't actually show everywhere it is, but it basically shows you where it started and, and how, fast it, uh, how fast it has spread. Colorado, right there now. So it came here. Emerald ash borer is a very poor flyer. 
They fly about a half a mile, and they are very clumsy flyers. So it didn't fly here. Um, where, if you look at, at this map, a lot of these areas are heavily wooded, a lot of natural ash, ash forest where it was easily spread. Here you had to cross Kansas, Nebraska, which don't, doesn't have a lot of trees. So it didn't fly here, it was brought to somebody who wanted to bring firewood here for cheap, and a lot of people come to Colorado, it's a great destination spot. Um, but that's how it's here, unfortunately. So we are currently under uh, a uh, quarantine where we cannot move any ash products out of this quarantine area. It has so far, Emerald Ash Forest so far has been confirmed, it was first found in Boulder in 2013, uh, since then, it has spread, it has been confirmed in, in Gun Barrel, in Longmont, and recently Lafayette was the most recent. Lafayette at um, the YMCA. That's how close it is right now. Now, those last three places, Longmont, Gun Barrel, and Lafayette, very, very small, very, very small pocket. It's not really spreading in those areas, so it's not really widespread has not been confirmed in Erie yet. People come up to me all the time and say, oh, I got literature that I have EAB, or some salesman came to my house and said that I have EAB. EAB has not been confirmed here yet. I think it is inevitable that it will be found here, and my personal belief is that it's already here, it just has not been identified yet. But yes, people call me every day, oh, it's in that tree. And once again, has not been confirmed in Erie to date. So the quarantine area is, all of Erie is in the quarantine area where we, originally when they were coming up with the uh, quarantine boundaries, they had uh, right down County Line Road and we worked with them and said, well, how are you going to have a quarantine and half of the town that we manage the urban forest is quarantined and the other half isn't? So we asked them to include it all because it made sense for management uh, uh, purposes for us. So it impacts all ash trees. No ash trees are immune. There is no emerald ash tree. A lot of people said, well, my tree is not gonna get it. I don't have an emerald ash tree. The emerald ash borer is the insect and will attack any ash tree. Any ash tree healthy or stressed out? Sorry. Um, the larvae feed under the bark and the trees normally, um, trees are normally killed within one to three years of symptoms. So the symptoms, emerald ash borer may have been in that tree for several years before it's even showing symptoms. At times they're saying that um, it can be in the tree for seven years before it's even starting to exhibit symptoms. So it's a very difficult pest to, uh, to detect. It's also at such low populations in Colorado right now, it's very, very hard to detect. Um, trees um, depend, Small trees and large trees are both attacked. Um, it, doesn't have, it doesn't have a favor. One of the key things is that it attacks all ash trees. Most insects only attack stressed out trees. This will go after a tree that is not stressed out at all. So just briefly on its life cycle, we'll see here it's coming out in uh, the adult stage from May through September flies out of the tree, starts eating the leaves, and that's normally when you'll actually see them out and about. Um, then in May and June, it's laying eggs on the, the bark, which are then hatching, and in July and October, it's begun to bur burrow into the, the, the tree. And here you see pre-pupa in November through April, it's getting bigger and bigger. And in November through April, you see it's actually getting some eyes there, turning more into the beetle, and the life cycle happens again. Um, normally, when I say it's a difficult pest to detect, is that even in its adult form, when they're out on the leaves, even these areas where they have these infestations, these trees that they know have it, there's not even a lot of uh, adults out on the leaves. It's very, very hard for them to detect. All right, so EAB symptoms. So what you're looking for is a gradual canopy thinning, much like you'll see on this left here, uh, which makes it very difficult because ash trees over the past five, seven years have 
Most of them have looked rough due to drought and various other insect pests as well. So a lot of people are calling and say their tree looks very thin in a canopy and they think that they have it. Um, another symptom to be on the lookout for is these epicormic sprouts or branches that are coming out of the coming out of the trunk, a lot of them in one area. It's a, very, it's a sure sign of stress. Bark splits is another key, key symptom. And then also big holes in your trunk, um, evidence of woodpeckers that are actually coming and eating the, eating the larvae out of the, out of the uh, trunk. So these are symptoms. So a tree can be symptomatic, but we may not be able to find the signs of it actually in there. So People call all the time that their trees are symptomatic of having the insect, but when we get there, we can't find any signs or actually evidence that, the, that it's there. So signs, what you're looking for is a D-shaped exit hole where that um, larva comes out, and that insect, uh, that male, I'm sorry, that adult insect flies out. It's about an eighth inch in size and normally a D-shaped. Um, serpentine galleries, so each boring insect has its own signature on how it's um, in its gallery that you can identify based on its shape. They have this very winding uh, gallery um, and then actually finding evidence of the larva. So it's very tough. There's trees that I swear has it. I go there and I can't find any of those three things. So if we don't have any signs, like that, we can't say this tree definitively has it. All right, so by the numbers, uh, EAB is responsible for the death of tens of millions of ash trees in 30 states. Um, ash trees are the most predominantly occurring deciduous tree distributed throughout the town and comprise an estimated 15% of the tree population on non-town maintained properties. That's a lot of trees. Um, or approximately 11,000 ash trees and it's 6% of the population of town maintained properties or 180 ash trees. I've been here for 13 years, I have not planted an ash tree, being that we always knew that emerald ash borer was eventually gonna be out here. So we're not planting a lot of them, but it is the number one, well, in the past couple of years has been the number one planted tree by developers to the point where one in every three street trees in between a sidewalk and the street is an ash tree. So that's a lot of ash trees out there. Um, it used to be one of the biggest sellers at the nurseries. Um, when Emerald Ash Borer was, uh, was uh, found in Colorado, kind of the market for ash trees fell out. But a lot of developers are uh, still planting them up and down the front range. They're not being planted in Erie and I do a lot of landscape plan review as well, so when we see landscape plans, we are telling people they can't plant ash as well. So all Colorado homeowners should be determining if they have an ash tree, first of all, and be looking for these signs and symptoms and be coming up with a, a plan on what your next step is. Um, Knowing, first of all, knowing if you have an ash tree is key. I was uh, telling a story earlier tonight about uh, people heard on the news that emerald ash borer is big here, and then they go to, uh, I go to their house to see if they have it, and they have a maple tree. They don't even know what kind of tree they have. So know what kind of tree you have and be looking for those signs and symptoms. And if it's a high value tree, you, you want to start thinking about some strategies. So. People ask me all the time, should I spray or should I not spray? What I can say is that EAB is a very dynamic situation. It is changing, um, changing all the time. And how it is going to impact the state of Colorado is very different than how it is gonna impact the state of Michigan. Um, it has been spreading very, very slowly here. And a lot of that reason is that we have pockets of ashtray, yeah, of ashtrays. <laughs> of ash trees in uh, municipalities such as Boulder, but then around Boulder is open space, and then there's a lot of areas where there's no ash trees. So that's definitely gonna help Colorado as well. Same thing in between Erie and Boulder, there's a lot of open space and not a lot of ash trees. They're poor flyers as well. So 
it's really that spread if somebody's going to put it in a truck and drive it to Erie or drive it to Denver. That's really how it's going to spread. But it's, it's spreading very, very slow here. Um, I remember when it first got here, there was a big alarm that it was going to spread a lot faster, and it's been going very, very slow. Once again, I think that it's in, inevitable that it's going to be in Erie. Um, and I definitely think that every ash tree will eventually succumb to emerald ash borer unless it is treated, because there have been none that have been resistant thus far. Um, so treatment is a major commitment. It's not a one and done. It's not an inoculation. It's not you give it a shot once and you're good. It is a commitment. It is a commitment that you're going to have to treat it every one to three years in perpetuity. And if you think about, you could get a quote that it's really not that expensive right now. Well, you got to think that it's based on trunk diameter. So every year that tree gets bigger, the price is going to go up. That's not even inflation or anything. So it's a commitment that you're going to have to treat this tree in perpetuity if you want to save this tree. Um, and not every tree is worth saving. And ultimately, it comes down to, once again, there's no one-size-fits-all situation that the person sitting next to you may treat their tree and you may not treat yours and there's no right or wrong answer. It really depends on what your financial threshold is, your risk threshold. It's hard to tell somebody that they shouldn't treat their tree, their ash tree, which in my opinion may be a low value ash tree being its condition, its shape and its size, but it's the only, only tree they have in their yard where they plant it as a memorial tree. So that's why it's an individual decision that everybody has to make and really what works for them. It could be the kind of thing that you decide you want to treat for 10 years, and then year 12, 13, you decide you don't have the money or you don't. Well, all that money that you put into it may have been for nothing at that time. So once again, it's not a one size fits all. Um, there are some great publications back there. There's a um, Bear with me. This is a really good publication back here. It's a decision guide. And it has a flow chart on should you treat your ash trees or not. Um, highly recommend picking that up. So your options include protecting trees with insecticides. There's several different insecticides out there. I'm not here to tell you which ones you should use, which ones you shouldn't use. There's different options. There's some that are more toxic than others. Um, there's some that will give you um, care for one year, and there's some that will give you two years, and then there's some that will give you care for up to three years, they're claiming. Some are applied into the soil, some go directly into the trunk. Um, there's a great publication back there as well on uh, treatment options, and, we'll and, and uh, well, that will discuss all those with you as well. Um, removing small and un unhealthy ash trees and or replacing with ash trees. So I can tell you what the town of Erie has done um, with our emerald ash borer response plan. And we preemptively removed a bunch of smaller trees, trees that were four inch diameter, which were very stressed out, hadn't become established yet, where we found out that for us, it was more economical for us to rip them out and put in other trees um, opposed up to treating in perpetuity. Uh, so a lot of our smaller trees, we did that. We were kind of ahead of the curve on that. And then um, some of our larger ash trees, our higher value ash trees, we are treating. And then some of them, we are just kind of letting them run their course. So that's an option as well. Um, planting different species of trees nearby to get them established before the arrival of EAB. I recommend this one all the time to people that have an ash tree but don't really want to put the money into treating it. It may be a eight inch ash tree that's not in great shape, has a lot of mechanical damage, isn't a great species anyway. And I'll recommend doing an underplanting, planting a new tree buy it under it in close proximity. So if emerald ash borer comes here, and once again, I can't tell you today in Erie when your ash tree is going to be dead. 
It could be 10 years. It could be 20 years. It could be 25 years. It could be a couple years. I, I, I can't make that prediction. But it's a thing that if you have to remove that ash tree, then you have a, it's, it's not a stick underneath it. You'll have a decent sized tree growing up underneath as well. So that's a strategy that some people are using as well. And ultimately, you've got to figure out what works best for you. Um, so being that this is in 30 states, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of great information out there by a lot of really great researchers. Um, if you just type in EAB Colorado, Colorado EAB, it will bring you to this website, which is great. It has presentations. It has all kinds of literature, um, frequently asked questions, all kinds of great stuff. So if you want to know more about Emerald Ash Borer, highly recommend this website. A lot of the handouts that I have are directly from this as well. Does anybody have any specific questions on Emerald Ash Borer? Sure. So, is there a timeline where this thing's going to run its course? I'm kind of getting the gist that it might go on for a long time. Uh, that's difficult to predict. So. It has not run its course, and it's ravished every ash tree, basically, in Illinois, uh, Michigan, the areas where it was first heavily hit. Yes, people are hoping that many, many years down the road, maybe there's a resistance, or they, we may find a resistant tree. But as of right now, there's really no time frame. And we're still kind of waiting to see on how it is going to affect Colorado. Um, I do think if you have ash trees, that are high value to you, I recommend treating. And that was something that two years ago, if you would ask me, I, I probably wouldn't even make that recommendation because at that time it was only in Boulder, and which was 15 miles away at that point. But now it's been, I said the YMCA, I mean, that's half a mile away from Erie. And if it's been, once again, if it's been in that, those trees for anywhere from three to five years before it started um, showing those symptoms and signs, and they can fly a half a mile a year in any direction, you gotta assume that it's here at some, it's gonna be here at some point. Um, if you have large trees and they're high value to you, then I would recommend treating them. Yes, ma'am. So we bought a house that has six pretty large um, purple ashes. So for the past three years, I've been buying the bare I don't know, remember the name, but pesticide. Mm -hmm. And been doing the systemic drench. And I've always been concerned, because we have a lot of other plantings around, been concerned about other beneficial insects. We have a lot of bees, wild bees, honey bees, everything. Do the systemic pesticides harm the bees and the butterflies, or is it? Um, short answer, yes. So bear is going to, it's a systemic, it's going to affect any insect that chews on that, that leaf. Um, there has been a decent amount of research been done about ash tree, how many actually bees and pollinators actually use that, and not a lot actually utilize the ash tree for pollen. But yes, it's a systemic, and it's going to kill anything that eats that tree. Um, and Bayer, Bayer was a product that I thought was going to be taken off the market a while ago, and the reason being is that People can buy it at any, any nursery, any home and garden, Lowe's. And once again, I talk to people all the time that said, oh, yeah, I put this down. And they don't know why they're putting it down. And there's also people think, OK, well, it says here little's good, so more has got to be better. So they're just pouring it around several times a year. Um, so yeah, I, I have a lot of concerns about people using stuff like that, when, especially when they don't need it. Um, as far as bear, bear will work on smaller trees, but once your trees get larger, it will not, will not work as well. I read in there, my tree is about stripped the, I guess, the concentration that I can buy over the counter, so it's not going to do the questions. Yep. Any other Emerald Ash Borer specific questions? Yes, ma'am. So are you suggesting if, if you decide to treat chemically to do that preemptively? before you even see any um, I am not. Once again, that depends. It's ultimately what 
what you decide. Um, some people are, some people aren't. Um, there is also research shown that you can treat a tree, even that's had emerald ash borer for, for a little while in it. So you don't necessarily have to preemptively treat. Some people, you may have somebody knock on your door and tell you that you need to, need to treat now. Um, there's a lot of those people that are going around, but if it's a high value tree to you, then yeah, you may want to think about preemptively treating. But ultimately, it's a decision you have to make. Any others on emerald ash borer? All right, we're going to move on to, actually, it's going to go to shade tree borer. So I struggle to find an ash tree that doesn't have any evidence of a borer in it. People, you know, they hear about emerald ash borer, they look at their ash tree, and it has a borer in it and they think that they have it. There are numerous other shade tree borers. Um, lilac ash borer, red-headed ash borer, uh, banded bark beetle, um, apple tree borer, all working on ash trees, even without emerald ash borer. So once again, when I was talking about tree selection, an ash tree, even before emerald ash borer, wouldn't be a tree that I would recommend because there's so many different insects that ravish that tree throughout the year. Um, lilac ash borer is highly prevalent on most ash trees, but I would consider a lilac ash borer a three on a scale to 10, being a minor insect, and I don't even treat for lilac ash borer. Um, but lilac ash borers have their, their very own signature as well. They have a big hole, um, not a small D-shaped. So a lot of people call me and they think they, they have emerald ash borer, where they really have uh, lilac ash borer. Shade tree borers are insects that develop underneath the bark of, all, of uh, trees. Um, their adult stage is insects uh, occur outside the tree and their life cycle anywhere from one to three years to complete. Most can, sex, most can successfully attack only trees that are injured or stressed, so they don't go after the healthy trees. Much like the uh, mountain pine beetle is a, is a borer in a mountain when we were having really bad outbreaks of that. Um, if they attacked a healthy pine tree, the tree would actually um, expel them out where you would see like a, a popcorn uh, pitch tube where the tree actually changed its pressure and forced those insects out. Um, so trees that are stressed out are the ones that they're going after. They give out uh, chemical signals that they are stressed out and then other insects give out chemical system um, um, signals that those trees are weakened as well. So positive insect ID and timing are important, depending on where the, what kind of borer it is and where it's attacking. Basically, every tree, every hardwood tree in Colorado, there's some kind of borer that can affect it. Um, so just blindly treating one for borers, you, you got to know what you're going after. Um, insecticides can control shade tree borers if they're applied when adult insects are laying eggs on the tree trunks. If not, it's very, very difficult. Um, but one of the best things that you can do is to promote healthy growing conditions for that tree. All right, who here has aspen trees? Who loves aspen trees in the mountains? I do. Um, but down here, they're just really not a great tree. Um, I've tried to talk people out of Aspen all the time. Sometimes I go ahead and get them anyway, and then they call me in a couple years and say, Mike, I should have listened. Uh, I love Aspen trees as well, but um, down here they get maybe, if you get 20 years out of an Aspen tree, that is extremely long. When I plant a tree, I want that tree to grow a lot, lot uh, longer than I'm gonna be alive. Um, they're really out of their element. They prefer a higher, um, they prefer slightly acidic soil. Down here we have highly alkaline soil. So they really, really don't like the, the soil. Also, they reproduce by seed and by extensive suckering. Um, and they're susceptible to a myriad of uh, fungi, fungi foliar diseases. Not to mention Cytospora, oyster shell, tent caterpillars, galls, aphids. We'll go through a couple of these. So suckering, who has aspens in their yard looks like this? 
It's never going to go away. It's only going to get worse. It's their, grow, it's their growth habit. When you see aspen up in the mountain, they normally grow in a dome shape. The one in the center is the parent tree. It puts out a system of roots that keeps growing new ones. So a lot of people will, you mow your yard, these grow faster than the grass. Two days later, you have sprouts again. Um, these are connected to the roots, so some people actually will cut them and they'll spray them with an herbicide, which they are then inducing um, chemicals into the tree, poisoning the tree, something you don't want to do. Also, people who um, have uh, put down a weed and feed in their yard, well, a tree, by definition, is a weed, is a broadleaf weed. So if you're fertilizing your yard and it has weed killer in it, and you have stuff like that, you are poisoning your, your, your aspen tree as well. There's nothing you can do to, get, to, get, to stop that from happening. So again, they get numerous um, leaf spots. Um, there's five different ones. Normally, I can find two or three at a time on, on, a, on a poplar leaf. So they, they really develop when uh, weather is cool and wet. So normally, early, early spring, when we get some storms, um, it will... Uh, it's, it's ugly, and it also will lead to them defoliating very, very early as well. Um, severe outbreaks can affect the general health of the tree because it can defoliate early in the year, lose all of its leaves, and be a very, very big stress to that tree. Um, good sanitation is the key. What I mean from that is when those leaves fall off, you want to rake them up and throw them out. Don't just leave them on the ground because what happens is next year, um, when you have three things, you have the, you already have the fungi who's there, so you have the inoculant. When you get enough moisture and you get enough, and temperature's high enough, you get all three things, and the cycle starts again. Um, there, there are fungicides they sell that can prevent severe outbreaks, but personally, I don't recommend it. Uh, I think, A, not planting aspens helps, and sanitation is a lot better. Because uh, uh, applying that uh, fungicide to very large trees is very difficult as well. Uh, there's Marcinina leaf spot, Septoria leaf spot. These are all just a couple different ones. You may notice them on your aspen trees. Often I see those side by side. Uh, there's ink spot and leaf rust. There's numerous ones. I, I, I struggle to find a healthy stand of aspen trees. I would say maybe... 20% of the aspen trees that I look, look at are actually in good shape. Uh, oyster shell scale, this is one that a lot of people have. They don't even know they have it because they don't look at their tree that close. So um, scale, they feed on, they, their mouth parts puncture the branches and they feed on the sap in the cells. And it often kills the cells at the feeding site. They cause limb dieback and and heavy outbreaks, plant death can occur. They can also make the tree more susceptible to those funguses and cankers, in which I, which I spoke. Um, management, hand removal, to using a, a nylon brush and scraping them off is, is a good management tactic, uh, technique. Um, they're very, very hard to treat, being that they have a, a waxy shell. So a lot of Systemic herbicides, uh, I'm sorry, systemic pesticides do not um, kill the insect. They do not move a lot. They, um, they lay their eggs, they affix, lay their egg, their egg hatches, and then it is in the crawler phase. And when I say crawler phase, they don't crawl much at all. Um, and then they complete the cycle. But once they're affixed, they don't leave, they don't stop. Um, and there are some other things. There are some horticultural oils that will break down their cell wall. There are some insect growth regulators, which when they are in their crawler phase, they can be sprayed and it impacts their, uh, their life cycle. Fall webworm, poplar twig gall fly are all other things that they get. I'm not gonna get into them a lot, but fall webworm is a, basically a, a caterpillar that defoliates the tree, leaves these big webs in it. Anybody have any of that? And that is one that's not, not major, um, being that they, they attack the leaves late in the summertime, but it's one that can just be pruned out. 
Uh, poplar twig gall fly is another one that is, is very common, but kind of a minor insect. Um, it's basically a fly that lays its egg in a, the pupae uh, overwinters in the, in, in the branch. So keeping your aspens healthy, um, maintain a proper watering schedule. Aspen will suffer if over or underwatered. Um, prevent direct sprinkling of leaves by, by watering systems. If you keep putting water on those leaves, when it's warm out, you're going to get more of those fungal, fungal spots. Um, do not spray those, those suckers that are come up. They're connected. There is a product that is called Sucker Stopper. I wish it wasn't called Sucker Stopper. It should be called Sucker Slower Downer, <laughs> which is it's a, uh, basically it's a natural compound synthesized from trees that tricks the sucker to stop growing. So it would slow it down to where you had to cut them maybe, I don't know, by a third. But there is a product out there that will help. Uh, avoid wounding the trunk with your lawnmowers and stuff like that. That will um, uh, make it more susceptible to cankers. And clean up heavy scale infestations. Overall, I would recommend even planting them down here because they have a numerous, numerous problems. As I said, a lot of people call me, what's wrong with my aspen? And normally it's all those things that are affecting aspen trees. Um, canker. So cankers are, is a symptom of injury um, by a fungal or bacterial pathogen. And it's, it's, normally, um, it's normally a localized, sunken, slightly discolored brown to reddish lesion on the bark. And it can frequently kill branches or structurally weaken a plant when it's affected. And it's normally a good indicator that that plant is under severe stress. Now, it can be on this one. This one is actually on a cotton, on an aspen tree. And it's a cytosphere, and it can also be found on spruce, pines, and poplars and willows. But it's very common found on aspen, cottonwood trees. And there's a nectaria can uh, canker, which is found on honey locust, oak, and maple. So there's a lot of these cankers that can be found on a lot of different trees. But very, very harmful. You can actually see this is the fruiting structure. And what happens is the wind will catch that. It blows on another part of the trunk, and then it spreads that canker. Canker will, uh, will rob uh, moisture from the tree and make it get really, really dry and brittle. So once uh, a tree has this and it's not, not removed, then it can cause the tree to die. So often I'll see where people will cut a branch out and they'll pile it in the back of their yard, which then they didn't get rid of the problem. So cankers are very difficult to control. Um, any type of canker removal should, I highly recommend having an arborist do it because you can do a lot of damage if you do it wrong. Um, there are no chemicals that are registered to control cankers whatsoever. And really keeping a plant healthy, good watering uh, regimen, right tree in the right place is going to be your best defense of, from uh, even a, a tree getting canker. Also, uh, avoid unnecessary bark wounds. And if it, you see a canker on just a branch or a limb, if you cut that branch off, dispose of it, get, get it out of there, then the tree is going to be a lot better. Often, aspens will grow in several different stems, and you'll see one tree will completely fail, and people will just leave that there. Well, that then blows on the other trunks and kills them. So, if you have aspen, go and see if you have. Um, I said it's a. You can see. Oops. You can see on this one, it's got these like pimple-like areas, and what that is is there used to be that orange hair came out of there. Now this is dry and dead. You want to get that out as soon as possible. Also, anytime you're dealing with any kind of canker, you don't want to do it when it's wet. You don't want to do it in the middle of the spring when we just got moisture because um, it will spread the fungus. Uh, anytime you're dealing with canker, any, every cut, you want to um, sterilize your, your tools with a 10% bleach solution. 
between every cut. If not, you can make a cut here and move it to another part of the tree. So, all right, who knows what this is? Anyone know? I have a canker question. Yes, ma'am. Is firefly a canker or is it uh, some other kind of nasty thing? Um, fire blight's uh, actually right after this, so we'll be talking about that. Fire blight leaves cankers as well. Um, so yeah, this is iron chlorosis. People all the time, this is a big call I get. What's going on with my maple? Um, normally, if you have spring color, I'm sorry, if you have fall color in the spring and summer, that's a good indicator you got something wrong. Once you find out, once you realize what iron chlorosis is, you'll drive down your street and you'll see how prevalent it actually is. Um, and most people don't even know what's going on. So yes, iron chlorosis is characterized by interveinal um, yellowing. So you'll see the leaf veins are green, but in between is yellow. Um, that's affecting an entire tree right there. Sometimes it may just be affecting a small part of the tree initially. Big problem out here because everybody loves maples. Everybody loves their fall color. Um, so what it is is it's called iron chlorosis. Chlorosis is a fancy word for yellowing. And it's a nutrient deficiency where that tree is not getting enough iron. Iron is a, think back of science class, iron is a major constituent in chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is basically the power plant of that tree what makes the energy for that tree. So if you don't have enough chlorophyll, you can't make enough sugars for that tree. So it can lead to premature leaf drop and branch dieback and eventually death of the tree. Um, it's a subsurface issue. It's um, soils in Colorado are highly alkaline and certain trees are more adapted to um, full and essential elements out of the soil. Maples really struggle with that. Um, iron chlorosis is normally seen in pin oak, aspen, apple, elm, linden, silver maple, and spruce. I see it a lot in autumn blaze maples as well, which is a big selling tree. Um, manganese deficiency is also deficient and its symptoms are, are very, very similar. So if you treat one, I recommend treating the other but at the same time. So these are the essential elements that, uh, that a tree needs. And if you look at iron, the higher you go up in pH, the less it is available to the tree. Same thing with manganese. So a lot of time it's that there's actually iron in the soil, but the, the soil is not releasing it to the tree roots. So a lot of time people say, oh yeah, I put, I put iron fertilizer all the way around, but they're not really doing anything. They're putting iron in there, but it's getting bound up in the soil. Same thing with tree spikes. People are like, oh, I bought these tree spikes. They're not really doing much either. It's a soil chemistry problem, and left unchecked, it will eventually kill your tree. There are really three ways in which you can treat it. There's a soil injection, which is um, you're putting iron directly into the soil or subsurface, hoping that the roots pick it up. There's a foliar, which I don't really recommend because it's difficult to do on any tree of size, is basically putting a powder on the leaf, which in the, then the iron will uh, be taken into the leaf. Not really practical. And then there's trunk injections, which there are injecting a needle directly into the tree trunk, which goes into the vascular system. Um, different trees respond differently to different treatments. There may be seven autumn blaze maples in a row that I treat with a, uh, the least, I, I recommend the least invasive first, which is, which is the soil. Um, if that does not work, then I normally go to the, injunct the, to the trunk injections. But there could be a time where I said there's seven, seven trees in a row, five of them green up with the soil, and two I have to go back and do with the trunk injection. Um, this is a problem that once you realize that your tree has it, and if you have a tree that does, you may have to treat your tree anywhere from every one to three to five years, depending on how well it takes it up. There are also some trees that the tree never responds well to treatment. Once again, tree selection is huge, but don't 
by not planting trees that um, are really susceptible to iron chlorosis. There are some people that will sell a tree that is very chlorotic and they'll sell you iron at the same time. That doesn't seem like a good idea to me. It's like, here's a tree, oh, and here's how you fix your sick tree. Buy a tree that's probably gonna not be sick to begin with, I think is a better strategy. Um, a lot of maples get very chlorotic here and maples are a very popular tree because we all love fall color. There are some maples that are better adapted to soil here, but I would avoid red maples, autumn blaze maple, Freeman maples altogether. Um, Cause they're all gonna exhibit some kind of iron chlorosis at some point. Any questions on iron chlorosis? Yes, ma'am. So you can either apply iron or is there any way you can make the soil more acidic? Yes, you can, but changing the chemistry of soil is very, very difficult. And so in a small, small section, yes, you can by adding um, atom calcium or lime to get it go either way, but it's very, very difficult, very difficult. Yes, sir. I was going to ask if the, is there something about the age of it? Or I've had mine for 12 years, and this, was, this past summer was the first year that I had this. Yeah, um, there's a lot of variability. Once again, you, can, you and your neighbor's tree could be planted by the same species side by side, and your neighbors may exhibit it year three, you may exhibit it year 12. That's why I say, um, like a silver maple, an autumn blaze maple, at some point your tree is going to be chlorotic. And once you, once you notice it's chlorotic, you should treat it because it's like somebody who has a major disease. If you get it early on, it has a better chance of treatment. Most people call me and they're like, what's going on with my tree? I just noticed this was going on. And I'm there and I'm like, this didn't just happen this year. It had been a progression getting worse and worse every year, where if they would have treated it a couple years ago, it would have had a better chance of. So if yours is now starting to show it, I highly recommend treating it because it's not going to get better by itself. It's only gonna get worse. And then I said, uh, keep an eye on it because it may not respond to, to that treatment where they may have to change tactics and uh, do something else. Does one other person have their hand up over there? Nope. All right. All right, fire blight is a bacterial disease. This, was, uh, this is one that is some years worse than others. It really depends on the weather. Um, it, it, it affects certain species in the rose family. It's the worst on apple, pear, quince, and crab apple. I would say it's probably the worst on crab apple and apple in our area. Very rarely do I see it on pear, but I, I do. Um, it also on hawthorn, mountain ash, service berry, um, and some shrubs as well. Um, Symptoms include water-soaked blossoms, light brown and blackened leaves, discolored bark, black shepherd's crook twigs, and dried fruits. This is a classic shepherd's crook, where I think it looks like somebody hit it with a blowtorch and, and, and curls it. This is what it looks like when it goes unchecked, and this is pretty bad infestation in a, in a trunk. Um, it does leave lesions and cankers. Somebody asked right here. These are, this is the fire blight where it has come off this, is now in this bigger branch right here. And this will continue to spread every year left unchecked. So there are resistant varieties out there. I recommend planting a resistant variety. Um, oddly enough, crab apples, everybody loves crab apples. A lot of people don't like crab apple fruit. So one of the most popular crab apple trees planted is the spring snow crab apple because it doesn't have a fruit. They get fire blight real bad when fire blight comes around. Um, prune out diseased wood at least 10 to 15 inches below the infection and destroy. So, and then sanitize your tools. This is one that is highly, highly contagious. You don't want to do this in the spring either. And if you don't feel comfortable doing it, I would hire an arborist because it is the kind of thing, if you don't sanitize your tools, you're just making it worse. If you don't get rid of the, break up the leaves and get rid of them, then that inoculant is just there. This can be one that could take several years to get rid of because you want to break up all the leaves and debris 
and remove all the sections that are infected, but all you need is one little spore somewhere in your grass that may cause it to happen again. So this is one that if you notice it early, it's easy to control. If your tree gets like, like that one, it's very difficult. Um, remove cankers is when you remove a canker, you want to one inch of healthy bark on each side and three to four inches on the end. Once again, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, you don't think you have that knowledge base, hire an arborist, uh, a professional that will get that for you. There are some chemical sprays, but they're not very effective. Um, there's our society, both for humans and plants, there's a, uh, there's a cure for everything. There's a magic pill that they'll sell you at Lowe's, at a garden center, at a nursery, for everything. Some of them work, some of them are a great product, some of them don't. Some of them are just sold to make you feel better, essentially, in my opinion. Um, so most homeowners would be better served by replacing a problem tree than going to the expense of bother spraying, personally. Um, and once again, there are several availabilities of uh, resistant varieties. So once again, if I can hammer in anything, choose the right tree in the right place. Um, ask questions, what insect and diseases affect this tree when I buy it? Um, what kind of potential problems am I gonna have? Do some research. You can also always call me if you have any questions about trees that you wanna get for your yard, or if they're certain size, certain color, certain trait you're looking for, give me a call, I'd be, be happy to Happy to uh, steer you in the right direction. Any? How do you feel about streptomycin? If you apply it right, I, I'm sorry, are you? For fire blight. For fire blight. I don't have a lot of experience in it, I really don't. But I think that most treatments don't really work well. Well, that's a preventative as opposed to. Yeah. Is, that, is it a bromide? Yeah. Streptomycin powder. That yeah. spray when it's I'm, not, I'm not too familiar with that product. I would be concerned that would contribute to bacterial resistance in the general population too. The possibility as well. Yeah, so I don't have an opinion either for or against it. Um, bacteria what would Anybody have this one? You have it? Yeah. So it's a common disease that affects the central core of many trees. It's, uh, it's, it's soil borne and it most likely gets um, introduced into the root system through the soil. It's prevalent in elm, cottonwood, aspen, and willow. And it's pretty nasty stuff. It's pretty stinky stuff. Um, affected wood is wetter than surrounding wood and, and it's under high internal gas, gas pressure. So the gas pressure will uh, cause it to ooze and bleed from a tree. So if, it's, if a tree has it and you have some storm damage or you prune, well, that pressure's been released and it'll start oozing. And, um, and it's very slimy and stinky. When I have to remove a tree that has bacterial wet wood, everybody knows because I stink after it. If you have it, you know it. Um, insects love this stuff as well. It is um, toxic to other areas of the tree. You can kind of see where it's oozing here, and it really never goes away. Um, it doesn't greatly alter the wood strength of most trees, so that's good. But there's no real way to get rid of it. Once you have it, you have it. Um, an old strategy used to be that they would drill it and put tubes in to drain it away. That's kind of old technology, doesn't really work. It actually introduces a bunch of oxygen into the tree and makes a lot of things worse. Um, once again, there's a key to a lot of this, that prevention of tree stress is the best management approach, keeping a tree healthy, watering it, keeping it uh, um, overall good shape is, is your best line of defense. Drought conditions make this a lot worse as well. Here in Old Town, there's a lot of these elm trees, cottonwoods, and there's a lot of bacterial wet wood. Nothing you can really do with it. Um, all right, this is one that is gaining a lot more steam. This is a, uh, a newer insect um, complex. Uh, Kermy scale is the scale insect, and it has an association called uh, drippy blight. Anybody have any uh, pin oaks or northern red oaks in their yard that are really, really stressed out? 
This is one they found in Boulder, and I'm seeing it more and more this year and last year. Um, they're predicting that this one is really going to hit red oaks really hard in Colorado. So it's associated with a bacteria that is sometimes seen as sticky resistance, uh, sticky, sticky substance that collects around the feeding zone of these scales. These little scale insects right here are affixed there with their piercing parts. And we don't know a lot about this one. There's a lot of research being done right now with um, CSU is doing a lot of research, trying to understand this one a lot more. Um, it's thought that the bacteria somehow enter the wounds with the associated scales. But once again, we don't know a lot about this one right now. Um, treatment, the best thing to do is reduce the numbers of scale. Um, and I would say if you have this one, contact an arborist and find out what's working best right now because it's a bunch of trial and error with this one right now. But left unchecked, your tree will eventually succumb to this and a lot are dying. Um, and that's how we'll start to thin in that area. All right, European elm scale. Anybody seen this one out there? This is another scale insect. And this is probably one of the most widespread, prolific uh, insects out there right now. Um, and it affects a lot of elms, um, cottonwood as well. Heavy scale infections will cause the leaves to yellow, branches to die and it causes a lot of honeydew, where you'll see a tree that is completely black. So Old Town, again, has a lot of old elms, and the entire tree looks black. Well, that black is because of the honeydew excreted by the scale that drips on people's cars and stuff like that. So the scale processes the sugars, and then its byproduct, the sugar as well, and that's what honeydew is. Very, very nasty stuff. Um, you can see it's a scale, so these are permanently affixed to the tree. These are actually the little, little uh, crawlers that then affix the tree as well. Just turns it all black, and these, this is pretty nasty. So this is a prime example of a tree that we have historically treated with pesticides and now is resistant to the pesticides that used to treat it. This is one that is largely ineffective in many sites in Colorado due to the insect resistance, using the same thing, going back to the same tool in our toolbox and not diversifying. So this is one that is very, very hard to control right now, which they're playing around now with some horticultural oils and some insect growth re regulators as well. But this is one that if you have, then you probably want to call an arborist and have them mix some magic cocktail to, to get rid of, hopefully. All right, Japanese beetle is another new emerging pest. It's, um, it's new to the state of Colorado. Um, over the past couple of years, it's been getting worse and worse. Denver got it really, really bad. Um, past couple of years, Boulder's getting really bad. I have not seen a lot in Erie yet. It's here, but at low populations. This is one that I expect to see more and more. What stinks about this guy is that a lot of insects are host specific. This one goes after numerous things from, from garden vegetables, perennial shrubs, and trees. And it's pretty destructive. The uh, adult will go after the, the, the stem and the leaves and they'll totally skeletonize that tree, which will greatly impact that tree. Well, some will look like that. That's the entire tree. So that tree lost all that green pigment we were talking about that makes food for itself. Major stress on a tree. That's a linden. That's actually in Denver. Um, this is a new one. This one's being studied a lot as well. This is a problem in a lot of areas of the country, but it's kind of new here. And um, Japanese beetle, they've they live in the soil as grubs and they eat grass roots as well. They normally show up in uh, warmer months from March to September and the larva will feed on the roots of grasses for as long as nine months. You'll normally see the adults mid-June um, begin feeding, populating through July into August. Has anybody seen this one in their garden yet? Has anybody heard about this one yet? You found it in your garden? 
And there, there was a garden in Boulder. Two, yeah. two in Boulder, I've seen yeah. that. Bo Boulder has it pretty bad. And, Boulder and, and roses. Yeah. Um, well, I can, let me go to here. These are our preferred hosts. Everyone in green, I'm sorry, everyone in red is a tree. So it, it likes everything. So normally we say, well, okay, emerald ash borer, don't plant ash trees. Well, this eats everything. So our strategy for this is definitely gonna be difficult. Um, adults are best controlled by hand picking. Who has time to pick off adults off your plants? There are traps that will trap and kill them, but it's, that will help if it doesn't make them go away. Uh, it the and attracts them to the property, exactly. Yep, but it, it doesn't kill them, but it's less hand picking that you have to do, I guess. When I think of if here in Erie as the town arborist, if this is a major thing, uh, what am I gonna go pick every beetle off of a, off a tree? So this is one that scares me because um, it can be controlled with pesticides, but I am not a big proponent of putting a lot of pesticides out into the environment, and this is one that attacks everything. So this, this one kind of scares me. Um, Japanese beetle larvae can be controlled with certain insect, insecticides or by insect parasitic nematodes. Um, so is that something that you would apply to the lawn to get, get it in grub form? Yes, there are products for that, and then there are also systemics that you introduce into a tree as well. But once again, you're talking about potentially killing pollinators, beneficial insects, and it's, that's, that's what kind of scares me on that one. Um, also, something that makes it a lot worse, they spend a lot of their time in the soil, and they like wet turf. Well, we love over irrigated turf here. And we live in a high plains desert, so that just makes it a lot worse. <laughs> um, there's some information on Japanese beetle back there as well. I actually just got an email today from uh, CSU, Whitney Cranshaw is about to release um, some frequently asked questions on Japanese beetle as well. They've been doing a uh, a lot of research on them. They're going to have new recommendations coming out within the next month. So if you want to learn more about Japanese beetle, definitely uh, be looking for it. It will be out there. So a couple co common minor insects I'm just going to go through, which people contact me all the time, but they're very, very minor. Normally, unfortunately, a lot of people don't even look at their trees. And the ones that do look at their trees are really really in tune with them, like, oh, my tree has this, is that bad? Uh, this is one I get a lot of calls on every year, is aphids. We get a wet spring, aphids are on everything. They're on everything green, and they're a very, very minor insect, but people really freak out about them. People will say, I have leaf curl, if you have an ash tree, leaf curl aphid is something that you're gonna get every year, and people lose their mind. What's going on with my ash tree? Is it dying? Do I have, do I have an emerald ash borer? Like, no, that's, that's leaf curl aphid. And that's basically aphids feed on, um, by putting their mouth part into the tree and feeding off of the sugars, and it distorts the tree, which makes it uh, curl like that. Aphids, this is one that people put a lot of pesticides on as well, and it's a minor insect, it doesn't need to. You can actually blast that out with a stream from your hose and knock out and kill most of those. Um, it's, there's a lot of uh, beneficial insects that will normally come and keep this one in check. Normally when you have a lot of aphids, then the population of the predators goes up. You have a lot of uh, lady, lady beetles out. Uh, I don't know if you guys noticed last year, there was a lot, lot more lady beetles than you normally see. It was because we had a large population of leaf curl aphid. Also predatory wasps were very high last year as well. That's a result as that wet, wet spring we had. So they're cyclical, the populations will go up and down, but this is one that I don't even recommend that you treat, but people treat it all the time. I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen this out there. Yes, ma'am. Does this come with pine trees as well? Because last year we had a pine tree that had, it almost looked like cotton candy. Uh, aphids are on everything. So um, it may not be one that, 
So aphids are very messy eaters. What they do is they jam their mouth part in the leaf and they put a lot of, um, a lot of digestive juices to break that down. And they keep doing that and they keep doing that, which that's what causes that distortion in the leaves. And they're very aggressive feeders um, in that sense. So it will distort different plant material differently, depending on it. But all aphids are minor. All aphids are minor. Uh, hackberry nipple gall. Anybody seen this one out there? Anybody have a hackberry? Nobody has. Ha if you have a hackberry, you have hackberry nipple gall. So this is one that people think um, is really, really bad. This is a minor one as well. This is basically a uh, um, uh, aerified mite basically lays its egg in the tissue and it distorts the tissue around. This is actually the little mite in there. It does not, it's mainly cosmetic, does really zero damage to your trees. Because even these little galls here are st still green. They still are for the synthesizing, and they're perfectly fine. This one doesn't require treatment whatsoever, but I get a lot of calls on this one every year. And I, tree, I uh, teach tree ID, and um, most people learn this one first. They learn hackberry nipple gall, and then that's a hackberry tree. I, I, I struggle to find any hackberries that, that don't have it. And coolie spruce gall, any of you guys have this one out there? So this is basically another gall, which a gall is a uh, deformed plant tissue. And this is by um, uh, a delgid that lays its eggs in there. And normally when it gets to this shape, people want to treat it, but the insect has already left. This is one that does not need to be treated at all, but we get a lot of calls on this one. All right, so that was kind of a whirlwind tour. Does anybody have any questions on any insects that we did not cover? It's hard to put them all on there. I just tried to grab a couple that I commonly see out near you. Any other questions on any? Are there any trees left we can plant? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, <Short> list? <laughs> there is a short list. Um, I am very big on tree diversity. And Erie has probably some of the best tree diversity anywhere in Colorado. Um, tree diversity is key. If you're going to plant three trees in your yard, plant three different kinds of trees. Because the trees that I could recommend to you today, in 15, 20 years, there may be a new insect that's going to come and ravish that. There could be a tree that I tell you right now is virtually insect and disease resistant, but in a couple of years there could be something coming over from China or somewhere else that has no natural predators here. Some of the trees that are some of our biggest problems in Colorado now were at one time recommended by some forester or nursery propagator somewhere. You know, from Russian olives Silver maples, all these trees were heavily, uh, silver poplar were all heavily promoted by somebody. Um, so yes, first thing I would say diversity. I can tell you some of the trees that I um, recommend the most. Um, and after I name those, do some research on yourself, by yourself, because trees are personal to people. I may say, oh, plant this, and somebody says, oh, I hate that seed pod. There's no magic tree. People often ask me, what grows fast, has great fall color, no litter, no insect disease? And I say, well, when you figure that out, let me know. There's no magic tree. There's pros and cons to every tree. So definitely do your own research on these trees. And if you have any question on any trees, give me a call. I'll tell you some of the pros and cons. Trees that I am really big on right now that I think are absolute studs out there um, in our climate, in our soil, is chinkapin oak, I think is a great tree. Um, oaks are known as low growers. The so chinkapin oak is probably one of the fastest growing oaks that I've seen. Um, Kentucky coffee tree, great tree. Uh, Catulpa, still a huge fan of, although um, a couple years ago they had some frost damage, but most of them came right back. Um, there's a lot of uh, new elm trees that I think are underutilized, um, such as the Triumph Elm, David Elm, Accolade Elm are some of my favorites out of the elms. The elm trees kind of got a bad reputation which, with the uh, Dutch elm disease several years ago. Um, but there's a lot of good elm trees out there as well. Um, 
those are a couple of quick trees that I can throw out that uh, I think are great trees. How about pine trees? Pine trees, so I do not plant nearly as many pine trees as, as, as I used to. And there's a lot of it is due to irrigation out here. Um, it's a big trend to go to reclaimed water, which is high in salt content. And a lot of evergreen trees don't like that. As, as far as evergreen diversity, we really don't have much out here. I'm originally from the East Coast where trees just grow. You don't have to plant them. And out here, there's very few native trees. And there's all these trees that we love from the East Coast or Midwest or West Coast that we try to grow here that are marginal at best. Um, evergreen, um, I mean, there's really not that much diversity. And the ones that are the most utilized, there's new insects such as pine wilt nematode, which is becoming more and more common. Um, Probably my favorite is the pinion pine, but it's really not for irrigated turf at all. It's, it's for drier areas. Um, Colorado blue spruce, Austrian pine. But yeah, I, I personally do not plant, plant a lot of evergreens. Yes, ma'am. The um, areas, I think are, I don't know, the new subdivisions, do you have a say about what trees they put in when they're putting in you know, along the edge of the road that's supposedly the city strip and all that kind of stuff? In between a sidewalk and the street and the medians, yes, ma'am. Um, if it is on, so normally areas like that are called the public right-of-way. It's normally owned by the town, but maintained by the adjacent landowner or HOA. So yes, I do have input and say on that. Um, we have diversity rules, which they have to follow that can have um, only a certain amount of, uh, they can't plant monocultures. There are certain trees they're not allowed to plant. So we review all that. Yes, ma'am. So then how long ago was it that you were not letting do ash or is it? Um, we have not allowed planting of ash trees for the past four years in our standards and specs. And then, but you can do, we've got three ashes we didn't put in. And then we're going to have to mess with them. When we grew, I'm a native. When we grew up here, my dad, we don't plant two of the same trees because some hits them, they're all dead. So now the subdivisions are all doing dozens of the same tree. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. I, I agree. So ash trees are not allowed to be planted, but there are still people that are planting them. So on Private property, if they plant an ash, if you want to plant an ash on your private property, I can't stop you. I can't stop a developer from planting an ash tree on private property. Town-owned property, then yes, we can say no planting of ash trees. Once again, I'm big into diversity. So when I look at landscape plans, um, I always tell them to diversify their palate. And then I also look at species in which they're planting. If they're planting, 25 autumn blaze maples, I tell them to replace autumn blaze maple and I give them numerous different trees, species in which they, they should replace it with. I give them a couple different options. Um, because yeah, there are people that I see them plant an entire subdivision in autumn blaze maple, knowing what I know about autumn blaze maple, knowing of all the phone calls that I'm gonna get in the past, in the future with people saying, what's going on with my maple tree? So, I, I use that opportunity when I can, when I see that, to, to tell them to diversify their palate. And a lot of the trees that I told you today are a lot of trees that um, I'm telling landscape architects to, to spec with instead. Instead of the autumn purple ash or autumn blaze maple, use a Kentucky coffee tree or a catalpa or a chinkapin oak and stuff like that. Well, we always use the petal trees, and now they mound them. They're going to be, so they don't get so much water, I'm like, where's this water coming from? Yeah. Um, so once again, if it's on town-owned property, they have to be planted to the town of Erie standards and specs. That's stuff that we would actually inspect. But on your private property, yes, I see trees planted too deep, um, too shallow all the time. Um, and actually, I think the next tree talk we're doing is going to be about tree planting and problems and stuff like that. But 
Yeah, there's so many, it, it's a hard place to grow trees to begin with. And I see so many trees that are poorly planted that we don't, we choose the wrong species, put it in the wrong place and plant it poorly. That tree doesn't have a chance to make it from, from the beginning. So by picking a good species and planting it right, that tree is, that's the best thing you can do for it. Any other questions on any topics? I'm sorry, can you replace? Ornamental trees, any suggestions? Um, uh, I think the hot wings tartarian maple is great. I'm not big into crab apples, and the reason why I'm not big into crab apples is because I'm into diversity. And when I see landscape plans, I see people planting the usual suspects. When I look at a park plan, and there's 100 trees and there's only five species. And it's the same five species I see everywhere. Um, so crab apples is one that is, I think is, is over planted. So I don't plant a lot of them. If a crab apple dies, I put in something else. What? About the pear, Pear is very, very over planted as well. Um, I have, I've planted maybe five pears in 13 years. And that is just because I'm trying to match up some, uh, some entrance that has three here and three here, but I think they are very, very overplanted. They're overplanted for a reason. I mean, they're, they're tough trees. They get a lot of storm damage as well. Um, I like the Tartarian maple is a ornamental that I, I plant a lot. I still like tree lilacs. I think are pretty tough as well. Overall are great trees. But yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, how many arborists are there in Erie? Uh, that work for the town of Erie? No, that I could call and have them come out looking at That I do not know. Um, I, I know of maybe three companies that are in Erie. There could be more. I'm not really sure. Um, there's a lot of great arborists out there. Uh, I highly recommend use, using an arborist, not somebody who is a lawn care company but also does tree work as well i recommend people who are licensed and insured um, and if you have any questions most of them will come out they'll give you a free quote and um, give you all the information they have and their knowledge so i highly recommend calling arborists to make sure they're licensed and insured the town of erie if you go on our town of erie forestry website there's a list of people who are licensed and insured to work within the town Anything else? Yes, ma'am. This isn't an insect or a disease, but <clears throat> I find that lawnmowers and weed eaters can cause about as much damage on a good sized tree or even a small tree on the trunk as, as bugs do because people let the grass go all the way up to the trunk. <coughs> oh, it just kills me when I see those no. weed eater marks around the face. Yeah, that, that, that's a major problem we have out here. Once again, it's a tough place to grow trees. And I, I try to work individually with HOAs where you normally see it a lot in HOAs, large swaths of trees that die, and they want to know why that tree died. And they have hired a, 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 a company to come out and take care of their lawn, and they're killing all their trees. Our trees are expensive, and they're a long-term investment. And... I work with HOAs all the time and, and their specs and making sure that they are holding their, their landscapers accountable because there'll be damage all the way around that tree and those trees don't have a, have a chance. See it all the time. Mulch is good if you can keep you know, uh, a little bit of mulch around that tree to, to take away that competition is great. But yeah, a lot of people damage their trees all the time and they, they, don't, know what they're, they don't know that they're damaging their trees. I walk around a lot in the new areas and it's like driving me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I thank you all for coming out. Hopefully this was informative. And as I said, we will have a, another one that's going to be on uh, tree diversity, species selection, right tree in the right place, uh, proper planting and uh, maintenance as well to make sure that you're going to get the uh, best out of your uh, out of your trees. So we'd like to hopefully you guys come out for that one as well. And then also, I do believe they are passing around a, uh, 
a survey. If there's anything that you guys want to see in the, the future, please let them know. And um, if you guys ever have any questions, my card is on the back. Please give me a call. I'd love to help you guys all out. Um, thanks. <laughs>